So welcome everybody. Um, so we or originally had another speaker uh, scheduled, someone from CERN. Uh, you may have heard that Carl's proposal to build this uh, vertical accelerator had been accepted yeah? and they are building this accelerator. And we had a speaker talking about this. Unfortunately, he declined. I, I put the link into the, into the chat. Uh, you can check the details of this. Yeah? So, but we still have a very good speaker today, Andreas Ruschaupt, and he will talk about physical implications of asymmetric scattering devices. Good, great, thanks. Thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the physical implementation of asymmetric scattering devices. So I'm located in Cork in Ireland. Oops, and... Uh, greetings from Hannover, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Nice to see you again. And uh, well, where is Cork located? Well, it's in the south of Ireland. You can see it here. It's not too far from the sea. Close to it, the harbor of Cork is uh, called Coben. This is, by the way, the last stop of the Titanic. After the Titanic left the harbor, well, you all know the story. And just to give you a little bit to start a little bit um, slow, here are some pictures of the surrounding in the south of Ireland. So you see it looks very beautiful, very beautiful landscape. And here are some pictures of the campus. So it's also, you see, this is a building where the president is located. There's a river flowing through the campus. This is like the entrance of the main campus. So everything is very beautiful. But maybe at this point you say, hey, is this maybe too good to be true? Of course, there's a drawback. And there is, of course, one very ugly building on the whole campus, the most ugly building you can think about. And of course, this is the building where the Department of Physics is located, as usual. So this is like the Kane building. It was voted by the students to the most ugly building of the whole campus. OK, so this just, let's start with a real talk. So what will I tell you? Well, first, I give you a little bit an introduction, a motivation about uh, asymmetric devices, why they are useful. And then in the next part, I will really go a little bit more detail what we will hit, look at asymmetric devices and connect them to symmetries. We will see for doing some of these asymmetric devices, you will need non-local potentials and then the question is first how to find these non-local potentials. In the third part, I will tell you a way of mathematically design them for the different devices, what you want to have. But at that point, it's just to write them down, have them mathematically uh, be. But of course, the big question is, is there also a way to implement or simulate these non-emission, non-local devices? And at the end, I will tell you one possibility to implement a few of them, namely a quantum optical implementation of this. Okay, so let's start with introduction. So why are asymmetric devices um, very important? Well, here I don't need to give a big introduction, see the talk of Gonzalo Muga, he spent a lot of time on these. Nevertheless, just to summarize it, so you, you find asymmetric devices everywhere. There are valves for uh, some fluid here where the fluid can only go in one direction and not in the other one. Of course, you all know these uh, rectifiers where you have a current which can go in both directions and then it will be rectified to have a current that goes only in one direction. And the key point, of course, of this rectifier is the diode, which has the diode for electrons. And this has infinitely many um, applications. And I think I don't have to convince really anybody here that this diode is really a very important object and has a big impact. And so these asymmetric devices, they play a big role in classical uh, technology in some way. The question is, of course, also you want to go now in the direction of quantum technology to see can we also get these devices if we have, for example, single atoms or single ions. 
And one idea, which is already some was some time ago, is to get an, a diode for atoms. And well, Gonzalo and myself, we worked a little bit on it. Mark Ryson also worked on it. The other people who worked on it, for example, we have some. There were some experiments of Mark Rice, and he used it for isotope separation. And just to present you one basic idea, one possibility to get this atom diode. So here we are assuming a three-level atom, ground state and excited state. And here we have some quenching. That means we have a laser which pumps um, level two to some level three which then has strong decay back to level one. So what does it work? And we have here also three additional laser. One is coupling level one and two. And here we have two lasers which are detuned in such a way that they just create a mechanical potential only. This is just, uh, so what will happen if the atom comes in here in the brown state? By the pumping laser, it will be excited to the second state. It will continue moving on. In this quenching region here, it will be excited to state three, decaying back to the ground state. So it will travel, continue travel here, being in the ground state. On the other hand, if it comes from the right here, it will be just in the ground state. It doesn't see this quenching laser, which only couples two and three. And therefore, it will be reflected by this potential here, which is created by a detuned laser. This is one old way to get, to get an atom, uh, a diode for atoms. Of course, this atom diode is also linked to Maxwell's demon. Again, I don't want to go here into it because Gonzalo in his talk, he already explained a few weeks ago a lot about Maxwell's demon and so on. But the main key point is here that really these asymmetric devices are important, an important tool and it makes sense really to design this asymmetric devices really for single atoms, single ions. So the idea is, of course, to use them then for quantum technologies. So let's be a little bit more precise. So what asymmetric devices we really want here? So the key idea is, okay, the goal is we want to have devices which are very asymmetric extremely asymmetric. That means we have here a potential and we're considering here a single channel at the moment. So we assume our particle can travel, of course, from coming in from the left or coming in from the right. We are looking here at the scattering situation. And as I said, we want to have like maximally asymmetry, for example, in the transmission. That means we really want to have if our particle is coming in from the left, it should be transmitted. That means this transmission coefficient here coming in from the left, this is a notation of the transmission. This is a transmission amplitude for incidence from the left, the absolute square, we call it here the coefficient. This should be equal to one. But when the particle is coming from the right, the transmission should be zero. So no transmission for right incidence, full transmission for left uh, incidence. So maximally transmission asymmetry. And of course, if we have a single channel, well, you all know, I will also explain it in a little bit more detail, but the point is this behavior cannot be achieved with a local potential. So whatever local potential here I design in the middle, I always uh, get that the transmission from the left is equal to the transmission from the right. I cannot really achieve this asymmetry. Still, we want to get these kind of devices. And the key idea is, uh, of course, it doesn't help really to go to, uh, it's not enough to go to non-emission local potentials. You still have the same problem. So the only out uh, way out is, okay, let's assume we allow potentials which can be non-emission, but also non-local. Okay, so, when we allow this, what are interesting devices? So we have a few devices here, which of course show this maximal the transmission asymmetry. And let's just go through them and explain why they're interesting, why they are fun in some way. And one could look 
at a device which we call the, a one-way mirror. If you have less left incidence, you have full transmission. Of course, all these devices have full transmission for left incidence, which we hear we have this green arrow from the left pointing to the right. This should indicate a full transmission. And this green arrow, oops, sorry, this green arrow here should indicate full reflection. This also means here we use a character T for full transmission, R for full reflection. That means here we want a device which have full transmission, full reflection for incidents from the left. And here from the right, maybe we have full absorption. Nothing is transmitted, nothing is reflected. Why is this device fun? Well, this reminds a little bit, if you think about Hollywood movies, the police station there, they have all with this kind of mirrors where on the one side here, the bad guys are sitting and they have here a mirror. They see themselves in the mirror, nothing more, but behind the mirror, there are the policemen watching them. Of course, that, that's a different principle how they do it there, but just as a heuristic motivation why this device is um, interesting or fun in some way. So this is motivated by this Hollywood movies police station there. Another one, of course, this one would be the one-way barrier. This is exactly the diode. What I've shown this diode idea for left incidence, you have full transmission from the right, you have full reflection. This is like this diode here, we want to get it for a single channel scattering situation. Another interesting one here again, full transmission from the left, full absorption from the right. So just the funny heuristic motivation of this, well, this is like the invisible cloak in the Harry Potter movies in some way. So if you're on this side, you can see everything which is happening here, but nobody sees that there's really a barrier and nobody sees you. And just for completeness, one can also have you think about a device where from the left, you have full transmission and full reflection and from the right incident from the right, you have full reflection too for completeness. So all these devices, they have really this um, yes or no or maximal transmission asymmetry. For completeness, let's also consider two devices here which have full reflection asymmetry. These are devices where the trans has no transmission, neither from the left, neither from the right, but full reflection, if you have left incidents, no full absorption for right incidents. And here for completeness, your full transmission from the left and from the right, and only full reflection from the left and no reflection from the right. So these six devices, they will play a um, main role in the talk because they all show like a maximal asymmetry in the scattering. And a few of them are just fun. Okay, of course. So if we want to really find these devices or look at the scattering situation, as I said, the first thing is one could try to write down where well, this is a corresponding stationary Schrödinger equation. One could try to find uh, a local potential where this could be even uh, non-emission. But as I already mentioned, if we want to really design a potential leading to a transmission asymmetry in one dimension with one channel, it follows from scattering theory that it cannot be achieved. So from, we have to be a little bit more general. That means we have to allow also non-local, non-emission potentials. If I then write down the corresponding stationary Schrödinger equation, it looks like this. This would be the kernel of the corresponding potential. Or if my Hamiltonian, I can write like this, and then this is the corresponding matrix element here. Okay, so far so good. So I have my six devices, and I want to really now try to find these potentials. But I also want to find potentials which has, should be as symmetric as possible. In some way, I want to understand what symmetries can I dream of. And for this, let's really consider, so what are interesting symmetries in this situation? 
So here we look at the client group where the P is here the parity operation mirroring, tau is time reversal operation and the combination of the two. So we can write down the corresponding symmetry operators or symmetry super operators. For example, well, you see here, we just call this symmetry operator three. This is exactly uh, the parity applied to our Hamiltonian H. Of course, in addition, we have here not only the two generators coming from the pi, uh, the parity and the time reversal, we have also this super operator, which corresponds to the joint of the Hamiltonian, because our Hamiltonian can be a non emission, of course. And together with this adjoint and the four elements of the Klein group, we get here these eight interesting summer symmetry operations. And of course, um, the symmetry, the corresponding symmetry of, of the Hamiltonian is e just if I apply the symmetry operation to the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian doesn't change. Okay, so we have this six interesting devices. We have this eight interesting uh, symmetries. And of course, the big question is now, what restrictions do we get? What kind of scattering selection rules do follow from these symmetries? And this is something, okay, one can just look at uh, generalized unitary relations of the S matrix or the S dega matrix. And by doing this, one can write down a table. I don't want to uh, not go into detail, but for the different symmetries, one can, for example, if we here look at symmetry six, local potentials always fulfill the symmetry six. That means if you have a local potential, you get exactly that the transmission amplitude to the left must be equal to the transmission to the right, and so on and so on. So that means here, of course, not too surprising, you see immediately that I don't get this asymmetric transmission symmetry so far here. And of course, because of this, I have this nice selections rules. I can now also think about which of this asymmetric scattering is possible. That means is it possible with this symmetry to design devices which have asymmetry in the transmission or to have to design devices which have asymmetry in the reflection. I don't want here to go through all the details, but for example, of course, if we have a symmetry six, the local potentials fulfill the symmetry, we cannot have this transmission asymmetry, we can have maybe have reflection asymmetry, and different constraints also exist for the other symmetries. What does this mean? So this means we can now write down for the six devices, what are possible symmetries which are allowed? This is just looking at the table and see what we want. And again, we see for a few devices, there's no symmetry allowed apart from the trivial one, which is just the identity. For some other devices, for example, our invisible cloak here, it can have some symmetry eight, you see it here in the table. And so we can really from this selection rules, we can now know what device, what symmetry can we dream of? Okay, so far so good. So we know this. And, but of course there's big, still the big question, how to get now these potentials. We want to design this non-emission, non-local potentials, at least first, um, just mathematically, we want to have them, which lead to the corresponding asymmetries here. And one way how to do this, I will show you now in um, the next part here. So the key idea is quite easy in some way. We first write down the stationary Schrödinger equation. This is our energy. This is of course a kinetic term. This is the corresponding potential, our non-local potential. This is a kernel. And now we want to design this kernel here. And the first thing, of course, we know how the corresponding wave function 
uh, we assume here that our potential is in some region from minus d to d. Outside this compact region, our potential is equal to zero. That means we now know, of course, the scattering, how does our wave function, the scattering wave function looks like outside the potential. This is not too difficult, of course. That means uh, on the left-hand side of the potential, if we have psi L corresponds to incidence from uh, the left, that means there we have our incoming plane wave plus our reflected part. And not too surprising, on the right-hand side of the potential, if we have incidence from the left, we have just the transmitted part. Same thing from the right. There on the right-hand side um, of the potential, we have the incoming plane wave, this time from the right, the reflection part. And of course, on the left-hand side, we have the transmitted part. So far, I think no big surprise. And now, of course, we don't know the form of the wave function inside the potential. And here we now do some kind of inverse engineering of everything. That means we assume here an ansatz for the wave function for left incidence in the potential region. Here, for simplicity, we just assume a polynomial, a polynomial of some degree. The same thing for incidence from the right. We also write down here a polynomial ansatz with some degree. Also, we do the same thing for this Kern function of the potential. Again, we write down a polynomial, this time, of course, a polynomial in x and y. And now the, the idea is just, OK, if we insert this ansatz in the corresponding Schrödinger equation, we get a lot of conditions now for these coefficients. Because if we just write down everything on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, we just look at different powers of x, we get all different uh, conditions for the coefficients. In addition, of course, because our wave function should be continuously differentiable, we get also boundary conditions at x is minus d, x is d. And this leads to additional conditions for the coefficients. In addition, of course, we can uh, look for some symmetries. We can really require some symmetries of this potential here, which gives us additional conditions for these coefficients here. And we can also, if we like, have conditions on the potential that the total potential should be um, continuous in such a way that the potential, if x is equal to minus d or x is equal to d, our potential goes to zero, that the whole potential is uh, continuous. And so this leads to a lot of different conditions for our coefficients. And then it's just a question of solving this and getting the corresponding coefficients for the wave function and especially for the potential. And this we do for a fixed k. So we fix uh, our k, our wave vector of the incident um, plane wave. And then for this fixed k, we can just calculate what is the corresponding potential here. And of course, um, then we plug in here what we want. That means depending on the device, what we want to design, we set here in, for example, the RL equal to zero, the RT equal to zero, or depending on what device we want to design. So it's quite, uh, from all this condition, you put it in and you get for the different device, you can really in a kind of step-by-step um, -step way, you can design the corresponding potential. So let's just... Can I ask you a, a question? Sure. Um, just, you know, speaking experimentally, um, you have, you, your potential turns on at a specific point. Up, up to that point, your incident wave or your incident wave packet is just traveling through a zero potential. How That's do you true. avoid if you're, if you're trying to verify any of this by experiment, how do you avoid um, scattering that occurs when, when, you hit, when, when you hit the onset of the potential? Um, you know, in an actual scattering experiment, you're gonna have some sort of scattering at that point. Yeah, okay, in principle, if one would really manage to um, 
experimentally um, implement this potential exactly the potential is a continuous potential and if one would of course uh, experimentally implement it uh, this onset is taken into account because what i'm here designing is in principle based on the fact that all this is a solution of the corresponding schrodinger equation of course if you say okay an experiment is never perfect um, in that case well we will see it one example also in the uh, part four when i will do a similar thing with gaussians where you which are more um, experimentally realistic and they are of course then the onset the scattering is taken into account but here also if you are able to implement the corresponding potential even if it starts at zero and then it's uh, it is first zero and then in, it increases if you would be able to implement it perfectly here one has shown analytically that this is a solution that you don't get for example any reflection even if the potential starts like this if i design it like this but of course i agree if there are experimental imperfections um this one has to then uh, take into account of course yeah the point is that even though your potential may be continuous it still has an elbow and that acts as a scattering center so so um this this is not a not exactly a trivial uh point um so so john freda and i wrote a paper on this because we were very interested in what would happen if we had a potential in a in a in a finite region where mm -hmm. we had incident wave packets of a certain type incident on that and that's that's a really difficult problem this is this is not at all trivial no 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 i agree yeah no, it would be one could of course look at this in more detail that's yeah yeah this i agree yeah okay great thanks um okay so let's just uh, see um if we do this how what do we get and uh here let's now look at the first example this one-way mirror here there's no symmetry really allowed and this was our hollywood movie police station mirror situation and how does really then we fix here our k the incoming wave vector equal to one and what is then the corresponding potential non-local potential what we get here the corresponding kernel is plotted and we see here is the absolute value of the potential plotted here the argument of the potential is plotted because it's a complex number and then of course we also checked if the whole thing really works that means numerically we just put this in some um, computer program and calculated numerically the corresponding scattering coefficients not only at the time for which or not at the uh, wave vector for which we designed the potential but just also to check if what we did really works if we solve the schrodinger equation numerically and we see very nicely it works we see at one for which we designed the potential we see that the green line and the black line they both show a value of one that means the green is the transmission incident from the left that means we get full transmission and we get also um full reflection if we come incidents from the left so this is exactly what we want here in this device and all other scattering coefficient they are equal to zero here so this is what we just as a check um with some numerical calculation of the scattering coefficients here another device Let's just look at the second one, which is like uh, similar to a diode. And here again, also no symmetry is possible. None of these eight symmetries here. And then we all again fix K. This is the corresponding kernel, the absolute value of it. This is X and this is Y here. This is the corresponding argument. And here again, we checked it with some numerical calculation of the scattering coefficient, if this makes sense. And here we see again, the gr uh, green and the blue line, they both, oh, sorry, they both show a value of approximately one. That means we have 
reflection, full reflection from the right, and full transmission from the left, and all other coefficients are really zero. So we get our diodic behavior, what we really want here. Well, let's do one more example, our invisible cloak here. And this is funny because now we can even have some symmetry. That means here we can now try to uh, design this device with a symmetry, with this symmetry eight. The symmetry eight for the Hamiltonian, well, all the symmetries are fulfilled by the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian in any case. That means the symmetry A leads to some symmetry for the potential, namely this condition here. And of course, this condition can be now also taken into account, as I already explained, when we do the inverse engineering of the potential. The corresponding result is shown here. Again, the absolute value of the kernel, the argument of the kernel, here the numerically calculated scattering coefficients. And here we see also, of course, we get only a transmission to the left here, all other coefficients are zero. The nice thing is here we see, even we designed the potential only for one K vector, it also gives this um, behavior what we want, even in some environment for this K, around K equal to one here. Oops. Um, let's have a last uh, example, just for, um, this device here. Now here we do it a little bit different. This is kind of something which can be implemented with a local potential. This can have a symmetry six. And here now we want to design a local potential for, which does has a corresponding asymmetric behavior, not only for one K, but for some range of Ks. And here we do this using the Born approximation. So this is different from this inverse engineering, what I had explained. And this is a corresponding Fourier transform of our potential, which is now local. Then, of course, in the Born approximation, you can calculate the reflection for incident from the left and from incident from the right based on this Fourier transformation. We want to have this goal for our device. And now it's quite easy because if we want this, we get uh, we know exactly how does our Fourier transformation of the potential looks like. For example, if k is smaller than zero, that means we want to have a reflection RL equal to minus one. That means this function here should grow proportional to k, because here we have the k in the denominator. That means we want to have this if k is equal to zero, and this function should be equal to zero for positive k. So this is like a step function. It's not a step function. It's it's a kind of step. It's zero, and then it increases linearly with k. Then, of course, we want to have the potential. We just have to do the Fourier transformation. We get here some distribution out of it, namely exactly this one here, the derivative of this object here. If you do the derivative, this is here the corresponding uh, distribution. What we have to implement. Well, okay, now you are saying, well, okay, this is the analytical solution, but how to really implement this distribution? Well, the idea is just instead of doing this limit, if epsilon goes to zero, you can do a kind of choose a small epsilon and then implement this corresponding local non Hermitian potential. You will get something which you don't expect to be perfect, but it still should still look good. So here you see the corresponding result for very small epsilon. This is the corresponding potential here, the real and the imaginary part. So we don't see it doesn't diverge because we have a fixed epsilon. We don't do this limit epsilon goes to zero. And here we numerically calculate the corresponding scattering coefficients. And we see for a broad range of K values, we get that exactly our scattering coefficients are nearly constant. We see that the RR and the RL, they are both one. And this, um, sorry, uh, the TR and the TL, they are both one. And the TL is also one and the TR is zero. So we see this, oops, 
this asymmetry in the reflection here. And here just I want to mention is, of course, we have here also alpha is here constant, which we can tune, uh, which is like a free parameter here. And so we see we get really this desired result in a broad k range. Of course, at some point for small k, it breaks down. Why? Because we are not doing here the limit epsilon goes to zero. We just have a small but finite epsilon value here. So this is an alternative way special for this device to design it in such a way that it not only works for one k value, but in a broad range of k values. OK, so far, uh, OK, I've shown you um, how to design this non-local potentials, which do provide this asymmetric scattering. And of course, a big question is really how to physically implement that. And in the following, I will tell you a little bit one possibility for a quantum optical implementation of these device potentials. And here the setting, we assume a quite well-known setting. We have a two-level atom and a laser. So the atom, this should, for example, uh, represent the two-level atom. It's moving, and we have a laser shining perpendicular to the motion of uh, the atom. The laser is uh, corresponds to some spatial Rabi frequency. Omega should be the corresponding Rabi frequency. Delta is the detuning. That's the difference between the frequency of the laser and the transition of the two levels. The second level might be um, not stable. Gamma should be the corresponding decay rate. And then if I want to describe this situation, this is a well-known situation which uh, uh, is implemented a lot of times in different labs. And uh, this two-level atom, of course, the internal states are used a lot as quantum, uh, as qubits in uh, quantum computing. And so this is a well-known setting. It's a standard setting. And if you want to describe it, the corresponding Hamiltonian in the rotating uh, wave approximation using the usual laser-based interaction picture, then it looks like this. So here, the wave function, of course, has two components. One corresponds to the ground state. One corresponds to the excited state. This is the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian, and this is our potential, which describes the coupling, uh, the coupling of the laser between level one and level two. Again, as I said, this is the run frequency. This is our detuning, and this is our decay rate. Here. So far, it's standard. And now let's look at the state corresponding stationary Schrodinger equation. Looks like this. As I said, our wave function is a two component wave function. And now we apply standard partitioning technique. That means we are rewriting the stationary Schrodinger equation. These are two coupled equations. Now, as an exact integral differential equation just for the ground state. So there's a standard procedure by, developed by Feschbach to do this. So we can rewrite these two equations as one exact equation just for the ground state. And if you do this, you see you achieve then an equation if you just restrict the ground state, which has here a non-local term, which looks like your equation with a non-local potential. And this is like the key. So let's evaluate this really. How does this corresponding non this kernel, this kernel of the potential now looks like? And if you do it, I don't want to go here through the details, um, but you can just do it. This P and Q are the corresponding uh, complementary projectors on the ground or on the excited state. And you can then really evaluate this part here, even if it looks complicated. At the end, this is what you get. So that means with this setting, very simple setting of a two-level atom and a laser, you can really simulate non-local, non-emission potentials of this form. And this is now, of course, the nice idea. We can simulate these potentials. Can we now use these potentials to get our devices? A few of our six devices. And again, as I said, yeah, so we can really simulate 
this uh, type of potential now. And of course, we want now to get our six devices. And before we start with this, we can let's have a look at the symmetries. We also want to have the devices. We want to have uh, non-local potentials, which have some symmetries. So if we, of course, now look at our table of the eight symmetries, we know how to simulate these non-local potentials of this form. And now it's an easy calculation to see, okay, if we require specific symmetries, what do we have to demand for the Rabi frequency or for uh, the, the Q? The Q is just uh, contained the detuning and the gamma. And you find, get some conditions. I don't want to go through all them. A few of them, okay, they implement automatically that uh, your Hamiltonian is Hermitian. So you can really, on, of course, you get non local potentials of this form. But open question is still maybe even more can be done here, but at least one gets non local potential of this form, one can simulate them. And you can even design a few which have a non trivial symmetry, for example, like this symmetry six or symmetry eight here. Okay, so far, so we know we can simulate this. Uh, non-local potentials. We know if we want a specific symmetry, what do we have to, what are the conditions for the Rabi frequency, for example. And now let's come back really to our six devices. Let's start with looking at uh, the one-way T-filter, the inv invisibility cloak. Oops. Here, this can have a symmetry, this can have symmetry eight. So really we want to design here now a potential which has the symmetry eight. That means our Rabi frequency should fulfill this condition here. This can be a, a phase which we put here just uh, to one. And how did we now find this Rabi frequency? Well, our goal was here too, that the Rabi frequency is simple in the sense that's easy to implement experimentally. This is, we assumed here, that the Rabi frequency is just a um, linear combination of Gaussians. Because Gaussians is quite easy. If you have a laser, the corresponding intensity is automatically Gaussian. Therefore, we assume here two Gaussians, which are displaced. This is like the intensity. And of course, with the two, you can also, you're able to really uh, have uh, designed the real and the imaginary part of the Rabi frequency independently in the experiment. And so now the thing is we used this ansatz. The width of the Gaussian was fixed to a value which makes sense. And then the only three parameters are this A, this X naught, this is like the displacement of the two Gaussians. This is a detuning. So you have only a few parameters and we, they were then found numerically. We used the grape algorithm. And of course, we forced it to have the required transmission and reflection properties for a fixed k-vector. So we fix the k-vector, we fix what we want as transmission and reflection. Then you had only three parameters. It's quite easy to numerically really find the corresponding solution which does the job. So how does it look like? Well, here is plotted the corresponding Rabi frequency, <coughs> which exactly gives the corresponding device. We fixed here, well, we, we talk, didn't talk here about K, we talked here about velocity to make it a little bit easier maybe to see the number. So velocity, we defined a velocity unit like this. We did everything in dimensionless units here. We defined a time unit. This would be the corresponding velocity. And then these were the numbers which are found numerically. We assume here no gamma is equal to zero. And of course, we also checked if what we got makes sense. So of course, these are dimensionless units, but would it make sense experimentally? Um, we put in the mass of a beryllium ion, then the corresponding length unit would approximately be 10 micrometer. The corresponding laser waste of the Gaussian would be of the order 1.4 micrometer. The velocity unit would be 0 0.67, which means the velocity we are talking about is of the order of 27 centimeters per second, and our time unit is around 15 milliseconds. So the values sound reasonable. Of course, one could here also consider other ions, but this was just a check. 
where we put in some numbers and we found hopefully that this is reasonable and experimentally uh, possible. Okay, so we have then found really the corresponding rabbit frequencies. And then of course, they correspond to a non-local non-emission potential by this formula, what we had seen before. And just if we plot these corresponding, how do the uh, kernel looks like? Again, I'm plotting here the absolute value. I'm plotting here the face of it. It looks like this. And maybe more interesting is, of course, now the check. If we really calculate now numerically the transmission and reflection coefficients, oops, um, does it really work? And we see, yes, yes, for the velocity, what we want, and even for the environment of it, we exactly get what we want. That means full transmission from left to right. And we get also here full absorption if we come from the right. Uh, and so it works. Okay, it works, but um, which is good. Uh, but we also wanted to understand it better because why does it work? just to get a little bit of physical idea why it really does the job. And for this, we did a classical approximation. We said, okay, let's assume that we, our atom moves classically. And we only consider the internal state of the atom quantum mechanical, which means formally we replace X by plus or minus V times T. This was a simplification. And the goal was to see, do we still get this asymmetric behavior or is the quantum motion really important for this, for the device to work? And it turns out that it still works. That means for left incidence, of course, left incidence now means we more or less start here at time equal to zero, then we move in this direction until final time. Then we will first get the real part, then the imaginary part. And the blue line is the ground state. We start in the ground state and, oops, sorry, and we end up in the brown state, that means we get transmission. And for right incidence, if we start in the brown state, the whole thing is being excited to state two. That means if we just restrict condition on the ground state, we get full absorption. So that means the device still works, even if we consider the uh, motion classically. Okay, good. We want to do it even more brutal in the sense that we were interested, do we need this Gaussian shape? Is it important that it's smooth? Or can we be very brutal and just replace this Gaussian by um, boxes here, by like of step functions? So that means we did this classical approximation and um, we also approximated our Gaussian by step function and it still worked. And in some way it was fun because first one could think about it, which is not true, that this violates like time reversal invariance, because here you do first uh, a function, which is just a real omega of a constant value. Then you do an imaginary omega. This gives you, uh, you end up in the ground state. On the other hand, if you first do the imaginary part and then the real part, you get from the ground state to state two. And so first it looked a little bit tight. Is this really, why is it like this? If we just swap the order, it does something else, something different. But of course, it can be easily understood. If you really look what happens on a block sphere, block sphere is a nice way if you have a two level system to represent the state where the North Pole is a ground state and the South Pole is excited state. And the whole thing in this simplification is then like two rotations on the block sphere. So you first rotate if you have incidence from the left, then you first rotate around this axis here, which brings you from the North Pole to the equator. Then you rotate around another axis, which brings you then back from the equator to the North Pole. That means you, incident, you come in in state one, you leave in state one. On the other hand, incidents from the right, you just swap the order of the rotations. That means you start first in the North Pole, you go to the equator, then you do a rotation of the other axis. And this brings you now from the equator to the South Pole. So this really means that, of course, the origin of this asymmetry is that the two rotations, they don't commute. They do something 
completely different depending on the order. And so this was funny really to understand in some way where this asymmetry comes from. But it was not only, well, it was funny, but it was also useful because if one understands this, you can now use it to derive approximations for the fitting parameters. Because if you know really in this very simple picture, you know where is the rotation vector, you know how, how far you have to rotate. And this you can translate in approximations for these fitting parameters. Like here we see the blue line. This is the height of the Rabi frequency, the intensity, the detuning. And we see the numerical values, which we just found completely numerically, are really always in the neighborhood of this fitting parameter. The fitting parameter, they're just brutally done in this complete approximation of square function classical motion. But they still, this approximation gives a good starting point for the further numerical optimization. So it's not only fun to understand this asymmetry, but you can also use it to get a good starting point for the fitting parameter for even for a broad range of velocities, you can design this device. Okay, then just a, a second example, which is also fun. Um, of course, another interesting example is really this, yeah, the police station. The thing is here, um, you cannot really, with this potential, what we can here implement, you cannot really get the full wonderful police station situation because you can easily see it's just looking by probability conservation in this two level system. But we wanted to here design like a, a partial police station mirror. That means we have full absorption from the right, but the transmission and the reflection is exactly one half coming from uh, the left. And here the same trick like before, so I maybe will go through it very quickly. Uh, we started with uh, linear combinations of two Gaussians. We have some fitting parameters here, the B and the C and the detuning. They are found using numerical algorithm for a fixed K. And this is the result of the Rabi frequency here. We fix the K or the velocity equal to eight. And this is like the real part. This is the imaginary part. Again, this is the corresponding non-local non-hermitian potential or the kernel. And the interesting part is of course, again, to check if we get this behavior here. And here we see, of course, for this velocity of eight, this is for which we designed the potential. If you look, we get a full uh, absorption here from the right and the transmission, the red and the green, they are exactly at one half. That means incident from the left leads to one half transmission, one half reflection. So it also works here. Okay, I think with this, I'm nearly at the end of my talk. So let's briefly summarize what I've told you here. So the key idea was really this different devices with asymmetric scattering, the six devices. And we wanted to design them and we wanted to make them as symmetric as possible in, so, in the sense that we looked at these eight symmetries and we derived some selection rules in such a way that we could say, okay, which device is possible with which symmetry. And then of course we wanted to design this uh, for some of the devices, as I said, you need non-emission, non-local potentials. We wanted first to design these non-local device potential. Here, the main idea which we used were this inverse scattering approach with um, this polynomial ansatz. And then in the last part, I showed you really how one can really implement or simulate these non-local device potentials, namely by a very simple setting of a two-level atom and a laser perpendicular to the motion of the atom. Of course, uh, this is not just done by me. I have to thank a lot of people here who worked on this. For example, I would like to thank my research group in Cork. Tom and Chris, they are PhD students. Tom has finished soon. Ying is a postdoc there. Um, Dave is a senior um, member of the group. Guido is a master student. He's working on uh, 
time and quantum mechanics. This also needs complex potentials. And so this is also related to it. And Tom has also worked on uh, this first result on the inverse engineering, what I told you. Okay, Manuel, Chris, and Ying, they are working on quantum control with shortcuts to adiabaticity. This is a little bit different there. It's the question is really how to do a, a very stable and very fast uh, control of quantum systems. And there are techniques which are called shortcuts to adiabaticity. But of course, this is also related to, you want to use these techniques also for quantum thermodynamics. And then we are also in, have some connection to Maxwell Demon and what we had seen at the beginning. And of course, I would like to thank the co-workers, especially Gonzalo Muga, who gave a talk a few weeks ago, and all the results, what I presented today, has been done in collaboration with him. Also, Miguel um, and Anthony, they worked on it, and there are many, many more co-workers. Of course, there are also some people, fortunately, who give some money, especially this FSFI Frontiers for the Future grant, where we really look at these shortcuts and quantum uh, thermodynamics. So thanks for the money. And at the end, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hi, Andreas. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. Hi, hi, uh, uh, Andreas too. Um, uh, referring to your answers on um, uh, slide 22, uh, let me just go to slide 22. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yes. So it's like, yeah, okay. So I, I just want to understand, uh, you had a special ansatz, uh, polynomial ansatz for the wave function on the right, on the left, which are uh, of the polynomials of degree five. These, are these ansatzes uh, supposed to be appro approximate or exact for this particular Q that you are uh, looking at, a uh, particular K that you're looking at? No, no. Uh, so, so here uh, I use this polynomial ansatz in the center where the potential is. And this ansatz is exact. So the key idea is here, I really design, I fix the wave function exactly. And then from this wave function, I inverse engineer the corresponding potential who mm -hmm. then, uh, where this wave function is a solution of. So that I means here, I fix on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side of the potential, where there's no potential, I fix the corresponding scattering solution. And I fix, this should be the exact solution in the range of where the potential is. For a polynomial potential uh, within a, a square d by d, right? Exactly, yes. But how can it be? I mean, for example, if, if, uh, if the potential is separable, let's say your V of x, y, the polynomial potential, I, the, the series is finite, right? It's a finite polynomial, the potential. Yes. Right? So if I uh, assume, let's say a factorized case, so V of X and Y is some polynomial of X times another polynomial in Y, then I could uh, plug it into your equation and I get uh, an inhomogeneous Schrodinger equation for, for Psi of X. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, I, I should get exponentials in the, reg in the region where the, pol pol uh, uh, I should get the pol uh, exponential behavior of the uh, wave function in, in, in for minus d to d in the region for minus d to d with some uh, um, uh, modulation because because you have a pol polynomial there so uh, how can it be that the wave function becomes just a polynomial no it it, it works in principle you, you force the uh, wave function to be a polynomial yeah, the, the question, no, that's exactly my question how does this forcing work uh, because I, I just gave you I gave you an example where the potential is uh, a, a, separ a separated product of two polynomials, where you can actually solve the equation exactly. Um, well, the, the thing is first, okay, not for every potential, of course, uh, your wave function in the potential region will be a polynomial. This is of, of course clear. That means we are here looking, we are designing potential by this under 
where the solution in the potential region is a polynomial. This is like the starting point. That means mm -hmm. not every potential, there are of course many different potential where this will not the case. But here the trick is really, we force this to be the exact I, under, 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 I understand your statement. I'm just puzzled that it actually works. So my suggestion is to look at the factorized, factorized case where the potential, I mean, you, when you don't force the, the wave function, but rather force the potential to be a product of two polynomials, and then you can actually solve exactly, and then maybe engineer, you, you have enough parameters to engineer you to, to fiddle uh, with your solution uh, and to, to, to make it do what you want it to do uh, from the point of view of uh, reflection and, uh, and transmission. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. One, one could have other ways. I agree. Yeah, no. The thing is, for some times, if this is really like um, separable, you don't get all of the devices. It's separable, it's a very special. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah, no, but I completely agree. There are other ways to, uh, you, you could start really with potentials form where you can solve it. And here, we just did it with this, uh, as I explained, we fixed no, I, I, this to be polynomial, no, I, but I completely agree. Okay. There are many no, other ways. Not exactly what you did. I just was puzzled about why it works. <laughs> okay. It worked, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Andreas, I was a bit late. Olaf. Andreas. Olaf has, um, Sorry, Olaf yeah, has a question. Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, the construction of the potential is a problem of inverse scattering. From the data, you want to reconstruct the potential, right? There's, of course, a well-known method developed from the 50s, uh, how to do this. I think it's been generalized also for non-local potentials in the 80s. Uh, did you try to look at that? I mean, because that would give you maybe a general formula how to obtain your bilocal potentials. Oh, okay, okay. Um, that could be that they're really more, um, so what are you thinking about? I what think this has been, uh, I think the Makayenko, um, let's see, okay. there's an integral equation that uh, allows you to reconstruct from the scattering data. You need all the okay. scattering data of your you potential, mean, yeah. you mean uh, of your scattering equation. problem to reconstruct a potential by solving an integral equation, which is a famous, I mean, I forgot the, all the names. Malchenko, Malchenko. Malchenko, yeah, it's, it's one of them. And I think that was, Generalized to also to non-local potentials in the eighties. I vaguely yeah. remember, but you could check okay. that. Okay. This so, only works. This only works in one dimension only. Yes, that's right. But this is a one-dimensional problem, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. But right. inverse yeah. inverse construction of potentials was always ambiguous because you do not you have to make some co uh, constraints if you want to uh, make a line through two points. You have to decide whether it's straight or it's bound. So you need some more uh, uh, assumptions to get a unique solution. So that's in one D. In one D, it's unique. There is no I problem. Well, even in uh, in one D. Uh, in one D, it's unique. It's a it's a well defined mathematical theory. It's unique. Well, very well. My, my my question was maybe uh, maybe we let the speaker answer first the question. No, no, okay, yeah. it's a good. Uh, here, the idea was just to make it in some way easy by just by using polynomials. That means, I, I think it's a good uh, good comment. I will look at it. So, yeah, uh, just, just to avoid re reinventing the wheel, uh, maybe. Exactly, no. Here, we even did it easier in some way. If you just assume the polynomials at the end, okay, you, you start with these polynomials, you plug it in, and you immediately can get the uh, conditions because you have just to check what is the power of x on the left, what is the power of x on the right. The corresponding mm -hmm. coefficient in front of it should be the same for all uh, uh, orders of x. And you get these conditions easy, well, quite easily. You have to write a little bit down. And this is why we tried here, okay, let's keep it simple. But it's a good point, and I will have a look at it. Yeah. I should, of course, warn that this method is only leads to explicit solutions in integrable cases where you can. Yes. So it's being famous in yeah. soliton theory and so on. Yeah. Only reflectionless potentials, no, no mm. reflection whatsoever. Yeah, but you are interested for, in something. For all k, for all k, for all k, no reflection for all k. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. 
Ranjit has another question. Maybe you want to ask it loud, Ranjit? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, uh, uh, sorry, probably I missed it. I uh, happened to come a bit late. But the question is uh, the standard uh, quantum mechanics, that is Hermitian quantum mechanics, uh, in continuous uh, variable, let's say in uh, one dimension x, does not allow one to make uh, uh, probability amplitude at a point go to zero while simultaneously making probability current non-zero. If you look at the formula for probability current, the standard one, uh, mm -hmm. you would realize that it is not possible to make. So this uh, uh, in uh, other way of saying it is that uh, you cannot have a perfect absorber in the sense that uh, it is also not a perfect uh, reflector. Uh, so uh, my question was, uh, uh, I probably missed it. Uh, does any of uh, your uh, answers or various potentials you have constructed uh, would help to overcome this in the absolute sense? I'm not sure if I um, could understand the question because the, the audio was not so. So you're okay. So you say okay, good. If I understood correctly, please correct me. Um, okay, so this you, you want to also argue about this using the current, the probability current. Use the probability current to show that this cannot happen. Is this true, or oh, please? And what was the question then? Um, uh, so uh, I have typed in the question uh, in case if I was uh, inaudible. Can you please take a look? If I manage to find the chat. Ah, oh, we have a chat. Um, Okay, so you're wanting absolutely perfect. Okay, it's in the non reflector. That's an intellectual. Ah, so, so you want to make um, the probability amplitude zero. So you are um, absolutely perfect absorber, um, which is also a non reflector. Okay, so you want to have an absolutely perfect absorber and uh, from one side, and uh, it's in the sense, um, it's a non-reflector. Okay, so you want to absorb everything, which you can do here, which you can design here from one side. Or do you want to have an absorbing from that everything is absorbed? This is like, <laughs> Uh, uh, it appears, uh, I mean, what I need is uh, not so much uh, of what happens in the other side, but uh, uh, from one side, it has to be perfect absorber in the sense uh, the reflection is zero. Yes. Okay, that means from one side, the reflection and the transmission is both zero. This, this we can design. This we can design really uh, using this... Uh, non-local, um, non-hermission potential. These are more or less, uh, yeah, this is possible to the design, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, uh, the motivation for asking the question is uh, if we can do that, uh, it is possible to frame a first passage time question. So, uh, uh, usually it is said uh, not possible to, uh, pose the first passage time question because uh, one of the way to do it is via a perfect observer. So hence the question, mm -hmm. why it was said uh, it was not possible because uh, uh, not sure in terms of uh, uh, transmission and reflection portions, but uh, in terms of probability current and probably, uh, probability, uh, it is what I have written. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, your co author Muga has some papers on it uh, on arrival time. So, 
Yes, the, yes, yes. No, arrival times. Well, complex potentials. They have a kind of. There are one possibility. Well, arrival times is a funny. Uh, well, I could give another talk about arrival times now, but I see you all want to go home. Uh, but uh, they are also used there to uh, at least um, yeah, heuristically model detectors. You can, uh, you, if you want to really simulate that detection event, you can use one possibility is to use a non emission complex potential to, uh, yeah, to simulate detectors and then. You look at how much the norm of the wave function it decreased, and then you say, uh, okay, that the probability for arrival is proportional to the derivative of the norm with minus sign. But I don't want to go into this, but this is also another funny topic where complex uh, potentials play an important role. And Gonzalo yes, has a lot of papers on this. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I should look into your papers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andreas, Andrea I wrote my question. unanswered question already during the talk in my in the chat, so uh, I, I put it now. The point is, I was a bit late because of my parents, and um, you have an atomic beam and you have a perpendicular a laser beam, right? So yes. what does it mean if a Rabi frequency is depending on x? Does it mean that the laser profile there's different frequencies depending uh, whether you are on the edge. Uh, different the edge intensities. Different laser intensities. Or... It has a different, roughly speaking, okay, uh, the Rabi frequency, it's, it's not exactly true, but it's roughly the uh, intensity of the laser beam. All experts will now say, oh my God, well, it's E dot D, but, uh, and therefore you have like the same frequency, but you have like a space dependent intensity of uh, but now my my question is it possibly to shape the laser profile as you want it or is it always gaussian or how 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 do you get a laser profile which is the shape you want to have well here we um because you want to construct here device which has a certain function of omega no yeah there, there are possibilities to really play with the beam profile and uh, here we assume it's Gaussian. So if you don't do anything, you get a Gaussian, roughly speaking. And this is why we assumed here, do everything with Gaussians. We didn't want it to have a, to, that you need a complicated um, engineering of the laser beam profile, but there are possibilities or even you can have uh, different lasers with different frequencies, and then you can even a kind of X dependent frequency. So you have, this is also possible. Yeah. But here we want to keep it easy. We just have one laser with the Gauss or two, well, two lasers, but lasers with a Gaussian a beam profile and with a constant frequency. That was just. Okay, are there any more questions? I think a lot of people are leaving already. So let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Thanks for thank you. listening. Thanks, Andreas. Yeah, Thanks. Uh, the other one. Send, send yeah. the slides, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, please, and that's if we can get the slides, it would be nice. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Then we will post Thanks. it on the website. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.